the dark into the light You have opened up our eyes I'd like to welcome you to our program, Truth For Today. I'm Pastor Steve Carr of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande. Today we live in confusing times. However, God's Word can be a tremendous source of strength and guidance to those who believe. I'd like to invite you to join with us as we study through God's inspired Word. God has many truths He wants to communicate to you, but the greatest desire He has is that you might know Him and the love He has for you. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These words reveal how long he has loved you and how much he cares. If you will open your heart to him, I am confident that he will reveal himself to you and greatly encourage you today. Luke chapter 11, and we're going to look at the first 13 verses here this morning on the subject of prayer. And Jesus being asked by his disciples to teach them to pray. Now, how do you do with your prayer life? Is it a struggle for you? Is it easy? Is it something that you look forward to on a daily basis to spend that time with the Lord, waiting upon him? Well, I think that most Christians struggle with this subject. The reason why I say that is because that's what Christians tell me. When I ask them, do you have a time where you wait upon the Lord daily? And they say, well, Steve, I, I struggle there. Why is that? Why do Christians sometimes struggle with this area in their, their walk? I think that it's for several reasons. I think that it first requires faith to begin to talk to someone you can't see. It requires faith, a lot of faith, to believe that he is hearing you when you talk to him. I think other people struggle with, with the issue of why are their prayers not answered. They question, I've been praying about this for a long time. What's the deal, Lord? And so many times people just give up and they stop praying. Other people just don't know how to pray or what to pray about. And that's what Jesus instructs here in this particular text concerning. Read with me verse 1. And it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now here in our text, we have, I think, one of the most interesting stories. And that is that the disciples are asking Jesus to teach them to pray. Now it's interesting that nowhere in Scripture do we see them asking him to teach them how to preach. Only to teach them how to pray. I think that that is significant. Because 
They watched Jesus. Notice it says here that it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, that when he stopped, they were intrigued. Why is this guy praying like this? Why does he do that? I mean, what does he get out of that? What's the point? And so they're intrigued and they ask him to teach them how to pray. Now, I believe that it is essential that every Christian pray and they learn how to pray, what to pray about, and to be able to understand the struggles that are in prayer and to resolve those particular issues. That, I believe, is essential. And so for you as a Christian, do you struggle in this area? If you do, this study is for you. So have you ever asked the Lord to teach you to pray? That would be a great place to start. That would be an essential place to start in your discipleship. Ask the Lord to teach you to pray. Ask him to show you why you need to pray. Ask him to reveal to you the power of his spirit to enable you to pray. Because he will do so if you ask. Now notice that this particular prayer here is a, is a model prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said, Pray in this manner, or literally, in this fashion. And so it is a model prayer, not to be prayed in a repetitious manner. If you go back to Matthew 6, where Jesus is teaching much more extensively on this subject than Luke records, he tells them, do not pray with vain repetitions. So this model prayer was never intended to just be repeated in some rote manner over and over and over again. It was to show us a manner of prayer. It was to show us really a model and to give us an understanding of the specific issues that we should pray about. And so look at this model with me. There are four petitions that begin this prayer that are directly connected to God's interests and his interests alone. And they come first. Then there are three more petitions that are directly relating to man's interest. And so note here that he is giving us this model. Let's look at this in particular. Notice he begins with our Father in heaven. Now, I believe that Jesus wants us to focus on our Father in heaven, where he is today, his position, his throne, his authority, his sovereignty, and that he is our Father. Very important. He wants us to note him and his position before we ever do anything else in prayer. He wants us to acknowledge his care, his position, his authority over our lives. Now many times when I bring this issue up and I begin to share with people about God's fatherly care, many times they say, well, Steve, I, I just can't relate to that. I mean... You know, if you grew up in the family that I did and you saw the father figure that was in my home, I mean, you'd understand that I just can't relate to that. And I expressed to them that I can relate to that because I grew up in a single-parent home with an absent father. And I, yet I can relate to my heavenly father just fine. And I encourage people, they need to get over their own struggle with their own Father. They need to go on. Because our Heavenly Father is not like any earthly father you have ever known or could ever know. Now, it's important, I think, to note that what Jesus said to his disciples, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So we do not 
have an absent father. Our Heavenly Father came and revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ. And I can know my Heavenly Father just fine. No matter what kind of father I had in my household, I can know my Heavenly Father and trust him because he's trustworthy and because he has revealed himself to me by all of the things that he has done. And so I encourage you, do not try and rationalize or excuse why you have a struggle in prayer with your earthly father. You have a heavenly father that has revealed himself adequately for you to trust him, to come to know him, and to have an intimacy with him. Now it's also interesting that very rarely in the Old Testament do, does the term Heavenly Father even come up. Most of the time we read there our Lord or God in heaven and yet the term is used. In Isaiah 9.6 it declares there that we have an everlasting Father and several other places. But in the New Testament Jesus almost completely changes the way he addresses the Lord as only Father. And I, I challenge you, go look at the times that Jesus prayed and offered himself to the Lord. He calls him Father. And he wants you to call out to him as Father as well. He wants you to come into that intimacy with your Heavenly Father. And that's why he describes it in this way. Secondly, notice he, the second petition is, Hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means to be set apart. Or it's the word for holiness or sanctification. It's translated many different ways in the New Testament. But he is describing here that his name is, his character is holy and set apart, different from anyone that you have ever known. Now this, I believe, is really critical to understanding this term, our Father. Our Father is separate and different from anyone you have ever related to. And that's why you can trust him. You can trust him because he's trustworthy. And he is one who will answer. Now in Psalm 89, verses 34 and 35, it's a very interesting statement there. God declares this concerning his holiness, his separateness. He says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Now listen to that. Think about that for a minute. Here God is defining what his holiness is, how separate he is, how different he is than anyone you have ever had any contact with. He is a God who has promised, and once that promise has gone out of his lips, in his holiness, he has sworn. He will not retract it. He will not alter it. He will not lie to you. Now that's an incredible claim. But that's what it means when he says, Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy, separate, different. Because you are separate and different than anyone that we have ever known. You're trustworthy. And so trust him. Focus on his holiness and his separateness from anyone that you have ever known. Relate to him as your father who cares about you. And we'll get back to this issue a little bit later in this study when we look at the contrast between earthly fathers and our heavenly father. There is a big difference. Now the third petition here 
is he says, your kingdom come. You see, the Lord wants us to be focused in our prayer life upon his kingdom, not our kingdom. He wants us to be looking at what is his kingdom all about and what are we supposed to be doing in his kingdom. That's first and foremost. And so this is why Jesus taught in Matthew 6.33. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. And so that's why these petitions are first. These are where you should focus your attention first in your prayer time. Fix your eyes on your heavenly Father, on his holiness, and that he will not lie to you. He will honor his word. And that his kingdom is above every kingdom. His kingdom is over every kingdom of man. And then he declares here, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now it's obvious that his will is done in heaven. It's always done in heaven. But many times it is not done here on earth. And sometimes it's not done in your life as well. So his will must take that supremacy. What is his will? What does he want? What is the will of God for my life? That is more important than my will. George Mueller, one of the greatest prayer warriors the Christian church has ever known, said that nine-tenths of the problem in discerning God's will is that we have a will. And I agree with that. My will is a problem. It's a problem all the time. Your will is a problem. And you have to submit your will to the will of Him that has called you. It is essential. If not, you're praying to the air. That's all. And so it is essential. In 1 John 5.14, there John said, now this is the confidence that we have in him. Notice, is this where you place your confidence? This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Then John goes on to say, if we know that he hears us, then we know we have the petitions we desire of him. So this is an incredible important confidence that you must have in your prayer time. That you're praying according to the will of God. Well, how do you know what the will of God is? Well, the scripture declares God's will. If you're praying in accordance with the scripture, you're praying in accordance with the will of God. If you pray in accordance with the will of God, you can have total confidence that you have the petitions you have desired. And so these four petitions deal first with God's interests. Are your interests first looking to his interests? That's essential when you pray. Now, last, these last three petitions deal with man's interests. He says, give us, verse 3, day by day our daily bread. Now notice here that he is encouraging us to pray daily and to, to ask for our provision and for his help in that provision. Provide for us day by day. So do you have day by day prayer time? Very important. You cannot fulfill this encouragement without a daily time of waiting upon him. But people say, well, Steve, gosh, I just, you know, I'm busy, man. I, I got a lot of things to do. And I don't know whether, do I have time to really do this? I mean, I, I, I pray when I'm driving down the road. That's the most common thing for people to say. 
Well, I pray when I'm driving down the road too. But you know what? It's real hard to stay attentive and to wait upon the Lord to hear from Him because you're looking out for the guy that's driving next to you. Well, I pray at dinner. I pray at breakfast. I go, well, that's great too. But most of the time, that's a pretty short thank you for the food. Let's eat. When do you ever wait upon the Lord? Do you ever do that? Do you ever wait upon the Lord? Do you, do you ever wait silently to hear from God? I mean, we're talking to Him all the time, but do you ever wait and listen? God, what do you want to speak to me about? I believe that it's essential that you have some time where you do that on a daily basis. Now, what things should you bring to him? Well, things down to as small as your daily bread, your food, your provision. What do you need every single day? There is nothing too small to bring to him if you have need of it. I believe that's essential. In Philippians 4.19, it says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I notice he doesn't say here all of your greed. He says your need is what he will provide. And so what is your need? He will take care of that if you will wait upon him. So many times people come to me and, you know, they'll email me or they'll call me or they'll talk to me and they'll just say, man, this, I have such a need here. This financial need or this material need, I, I just, I, I have a need. And we pray together and I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times people come and say, wow, the Lord answered. He came through. And it's just such a sweet thing to know that, you know what, when you are in need and you acknowledge it, he will provide. Do you keep a record of those times that the Lord has provided, that He is blessed, that He has given to you? I hope you do. It's an opportunity for you to give thanks to Him. Now notice he goes on the next petition, which is very man-centered, an essential aspect of your personal interest is forgiveness. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Isn't this interesting, the way Jesus put this? He connects here forgiveness with the assumption that we also forgive. And notice, not just some people, not just the ones we feel like forgiving, but he says, everyone. Oh, why did he have to say that? There's that, that one person that I just, I just detest them. You don't know, Steve, what they've done to me. How they have offended me and hurt me. No, everyone. Jesus said in Mark 11, 25 and 26, he said, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I believe that this is probably one of the greatest reasons why Christians stumble in their, their walk with him is unforgiveness, resentment. Holding those those resentments inside that you just won't let go. You refuse to let him go. And when you refuse to forgive, he means what he says here. This is not some idle threat. He means it. If you do not forgive, he is not forgiving you. Now what happens when you are in a state of unforgiveness before God. 
It's like the doors of heaven are sealed shut. I can't tell you how many times I have experienced that personally. How many times people have said to me, Steve, what's the matter? It's like, it's like God just doesn't hear me. I, I have no sense of his presence. There is love. And the first thing I will ask them is, are you forgiving anybody that you got? You got any resentment in your heart towards someone? This is where you need to start. It's the biggie. You must forgive anyone for anything. Does that cover everything? There's not one thing that's not covered in that statement. So, are you doing it? That's the question. Do you focus on that every single day in your prayer life? Have I forgiven everyone for all of the things that have been done against me? I pray that you do. And then last here, the last petition, he connects together, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, this is a very important statement because Jesus is very clear on the fact that there is an evil one. There is a guy called the devil. He's a real individual. And he wants to stumble you. He wants to ensnare you. And he's working every single day to do so. And this should be a concern in your prayer life on a daily basis. Stopping to look, where am I being snared? Where am I being lied to? Because you can get snared just right up here in your head. Listening to those lies that go through your mind. It is essential that you stop and consider where am I being potentially stumbled? And then asking the Lord to lead you to righteousness. Lead you in a path of righteousness. This, of course, was David's prayer over and over again. That the Lord would lead him in that path of righteousness. Because he knew that if he held resentment against Saul, if he started doing evil, he was had. He was done for. He knew he had to walk correctly or the enemy would get him and so it is essential you need to be very careful in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 it says no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man in other words there are no unique circumstances no situations where you are this is some special deal, you know, where nobody else has ever been tempted like this. No, we're all tempted the same way. And so he says there is no temptation that's not common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so look for the Lord's way of escape. Look for his sustaining strength that you might be able to bear that trial, that struggle, and not be snared by the evil one. Now notice here also in verses 5 through 13, he goes on to describe and relate to us in two parables two of the greatest struggles that people have in prayer. What are those two greatest struggles? Well, the first is, why doesn't the Lord answer my prayer? Why is he taking so long? Have you ever struggled with that? I have. The second great struggle, he teaches a parable in verses 11 through 13. Do I really believe that God wants to help me? Really wants to give to me? And so Jesus addresses these two issues. Let's look at the first in verses 5 through 10. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves? 
For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. And I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give to him as many as he needs. And I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now Jesus teaches a very simple parable here. Guy comes to his friend, put in quotes, friend, and he says, hey, uh, you know, one of my friends has come and I don't have enough food for him. Hey, can you help me out? And the guy says, don't bug me. Leave me alone. I'm tucked into bed. I'm all cozy. This is just, this is just a bother. And yet the guy persists. And he keeps coming to this individual. Finally, the guy relents and he just gets up and says, okay, here, here's the bread, you know, good night. And the guy takes off. Now, Jesus is contrasting himself with your friends. That's the first contrast here. A friend. He says in verses 9 and 10, I say to you, ask and it shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Do you know that the verbs, all of the verbs here in verses 9 and 10, are all in the present tense or the future tense? All describing here for us very clearly the requirement for us to be persistent in prayer. Just like the persistence of this individual who came to his friend. The only difference is, is the Lord wants to give to you. He is not going to say, oh, don't bug me. You know, I mean, you've asked me this too many times. I mean, you know, this is just getting old. He's not going to say that. He is going to respond to you. But he wants you to ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking with the understanding that the Lord does want to give. Now, why does the Lord seemingly not answer many times? That's the question. That's the struggle that people talk to me about all the time. Let me give you three very simple reasons why the Lord seemingly does not answer. The first is, I think, the most obvious. You're, you're praying for the wrong thing. You're not praying according to the will of God. You're asking for something that is not according to his will. Or there is some motivation or something wrong about your asking. In James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, there James says, gives us two reasons for unanswered prayer. He says the first is, you do not have because you do not ask. Sometimes we don't receive because we just simply don't ask. But then he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so there's something wrong with my asking. There's something wrong with what I've asked for. And so this is the first, and I think many times, uh, most often, what my problem is. Secondly, God seemingly does not answer because you're expecting the answer in the wrong way. Now, what do I mean by the wrong way? Well, let me give you a biblical example of this. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 10 through 13, there is the story of Naaman the Syrian. You remember the story he came to Elisha the prophet and he said, I, I've got leprosy, you know, I need healing. Well, Elisha the prophet didn't even come out of his house. He just sent his servant out and said, Naaman, go wash in the Jordan seven times. 
Well, this enraged Naaman. He just got upset. It says that he went away in a rage. He was furious. And so his servants came up to him and said, Master, uh, why are you so upset? And Naaman reveals his, his expectations. He said, well, I thought that Elisha the prophet would have come out and waved his hand over me and I would have been healed. And sending me down to this Jordan River, I mean, that's a muddy, junky river. I mean, there are much better rivers in Syria, much nicer rivers. Why didn't he send me to that river? And they said, but Master, if he would have asked you to do some great thing, you would have done it. And so Naaman relented. Now, there is probably one of the simplest reasons why we seemingly don't get an answer to our prayer. We think, we're telling the Lord, I want you to do it this, 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 and this way. And I want you to do it when I tell you to do it. And the Lord just doesn't work in that manner. He will do it in his own way. How many times have you asked the Lord for something, seemingly not getting an answer, and then you look back, sometimes weeks, months, even years, and you, you say, Lord, you did that, but you did it your way. You did it the way you wanted to do it. And you did it in a very unexpected way. I'm telling you, this is one of the most difficult areas we want it the way we want it. But he, my ways are not his ways. And so he does it his way. Thirdly, we seemingly don't get an answer because we are anticipating the answer in our own time. As I said, we tell him we want it now. We want it today. We want it this way. And again, the Lord doesn't do it that way. Probably one of the best examples of this struggle is Abraham and Sarah. Remember God gave him, Abraham and Sarah, the promise of a child? And how long did they wait? 25 years. Now, in that period of time, they struggled over this issue. You will even find in Scripture where Abraham is questioning God, saying, Lord, I thought you said you were going to give me a child. And the Lord promised him again, I'm going to give you a child. Finally, at the end of that 25-year period of time, in Genesis 18, in verses 9 through 15, is where you will find this recorded. He comes to Abraham again, and he says, Abraham, at the set time, I will give you a child, a son, by your wife, Sarah the set time. And then, in Genesis 21, the fulfillment of that promise, verses 1 and 2. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Notice, he repeats this, that he was faithful to his word. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. God has a set time. And it may not be your time, but it is his time. And so in your prayer life, don't make these mistakes. Make sure you're praying for the right thing, that you're allowing him to do it his way and in his time. Very important. Now, secondly here in verses 11 through 13, the second parable, he says, if a son asks for bread and any father among you, note that, any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your 
Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Now, note here, this is a parable not dealing with contrasting God with a friend. He comes a little closer to home. God with you as a father or with your earthly father. Any earthly father, obviously, if their son asks for bread, they're not going to give him a stone. They're not going to give him a scorpion, something to hurt them or harm them. They are going to give them something that will help them, bless them, give to them. And so it's, it's an obvious comparison. But his point is in verse 13. He said, if you then, being evil, now stop there for a minute, you then being evil. You as a father who wants to give to his son or his daughter the blessings of, of whatever they have need of, but you're evil. You see, now some people struggle with that and they say, well, I, you know, I mean, I don't want to think of myself as evil. Well, we are evil. We have an evil, sinful, selfish nature. Remember Paul in Romans chapter 7. He said there that he had a great struggle going on inside him. When he wanted to do good, he said, what was present with him? Evil. When I want to do good, I find that evil is present with me. Now, why is that? Because we have two natures inside us that are battling against the other. And so we battle with this issue of our evil, selfish, sinful nature. The only thing that hinders us, that stumbles us, is that nature that is still within us. That's our battle. And so I encourage you today that you stop and you think about the struggle that you have every single day. And yet, the comparison here is clear. You being evil, you struggle with evil, but you still want to give good gifts to your children, right? Well, how much more than would your heavenly Father want to give to you? You see, He doesn't struggle with evil. He doesn't struggle with a sinful nature. He doesn't have to struggle with that. He is righteous and holy and just and equal. And he wants to give to you more than you want to receive it. You know how I know that? Because the scripture says his hand is outstretched all day long. Now, my hand is not outstretched all day long saying, oh, I receive, I want, I'm going to receive from you. No, I usually only come with my hand outstretched when I'm in trouble, when I'm struggling, when I have need. But his hand is outstretched all day long. He is more willing to give to you than you are to receive it. So how much more, how much more beyond what you can even think, hope for, or even ask, does that God that you serve want to give to you? But notice, this comparison leaves us, though, with the most important thing he wants to give to you. He said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, the Holy Spirit is the gift of gifts. It's the gift that keeps on giving over and over again, all day long, to every single one of us. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is righteousness, truth, justice. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering and meekness and all these things that He promises. The fruit of the Spirit is what I need in my life, especially if I'm going to pray and pray effectively, pray with the correct thinking, 
pray in the manner that is prescribed here. I need the Holy Spirit. Do you see your need of the Holy Spirit? You need Him more and more every single day. If you will just cry out, He will give to you. Now, I read one commentator this past week. In fact, he's one of my favorite commentators until I read this particular section. He said here, You need not pray this prayer anymore. And I looked at it and I kind of sat back and I went, did I read that right? And I read it and he said, you need not pray for the Holy Spirit as Jesus commanded you here. And you know what his reasoning was? Because Pentecost took place in Acts chapter 2. And I thought to myself, oh, I hope nobody reads this. And I hope anybody that read it, has ever read this, will not believe it. Because that is not what the scripture teaches. Notice right here in our text, this word, ask, the second to the last word there. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Do you know that that word is in the present tense? It means those who continually ask him. And I believe that that is pretty clear. Just If you just look at this verse by itself, continually ask me and I will give you the Holy Spirit to overflowing. But that's, that's not all. If you go to the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost, after the promise of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, do you know what Peter said to all that were standing there? This is what he said. In Acts 2.39, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You see, the promise of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is to you and your children and to as many as the Lord will call. The example of this is in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. After Philip went and preached the gospel to those in Samaria, they received the gospel. They received Christ. And it says they were baptized in water. Then Peter and John came down to them and they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute. Pentecost already happened. They were already born again. But here is an example where they're saying, you need to be baptized. You need to be and filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, Paul said, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That Greek word there for filled is a word that literally means to be crammed full of, stuffed, gorged, fully gorged. Now, that's what the meaning of the word is. He's saying, don't be drunk with wine. Don't look someplace else for what the, only the Holy Spirit can give you. He will fill you. This word fill is also in the present tense. Be continually gorged, crammed full of the Holy Spirit. Now, is that the experience of your life? Are you constantly, daily, asking the Lord to come and fill you and gorge you and cram you full of the Holy Spirit? I hope you do. I'll tell you, it is a part of my daily prayer life. Lord, I surrender. I need you. I need your life. I need your power. And without you, I will be a total sorry mess today. I will be a flop at anything I try and do. I will not walk with you as you intend. I need your power. And so I encourage you, if you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you may have been a believer for many years, but if you've never been baptized by His Spirit and His power, I want to encourage you, come forward, pray. 
Let us pray for you. Let us lay hands on you that you might be empowered by his spirit. It declares in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. And do we not need his power to be his witnesses? Especially in this day, in this dark day. So ask him. Let's go to him now. Thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to apply what you've heard today and mix God's word with faith. Believe his promises. Obey his commands. Take the action God requires and God will begin to work in your life. If you have never made a commitment to Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today by asking God to forgive you. Invite Christ into your heart. Turn from any known sin and begin to walk with him daily. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you would like someone to pray with you, please call our office at the number on your screen and someone will be there to help. Or in a moment, you will see a simple prayer. Pray this prayer and make your commitment today. God bless you and join us again next week for Truth For Today.
to me.